In today's lecture, we're going to look at how to analyze shear stress within beams. And you're probably thinking, uh, well, we already know how to analyze shear stress, calculate shear stress from an internal shear force. So uh, what's what's different about uh, this and beams? So I, I'm going to show you, and let's um, let's just let's just look at a beam with the internal forces drawn for a second. So we'll just make it a simple beam with a, a rectangular section. So something like this. There's our cut internal section, and the rest of the beam shooting off to the left here, and we've got um, a centroid in the middle, our centroidal axis, and we've got a moment. Let's say and an internal shear force v so if we look at the distribution of how shear stress varies over this cross section let's let's define a variable here that describes height in the cross section okay so that variable h is going to be uh, measured in that direction. And what I want to do now here is I just want to create a plot or a graph of how shear stress varies with height in our cross section. So we can just mark out where our beam is relative to the graph here so you can see. Okay, so um, the the equation that we already developed relating shear stress to internal shear force was tau equals V over A. And when we do that, we're simply averaging the internal shear force over cross-sectional area. So it's implied that all points within the cross section experience equal shear stress, right? So our line on this plot of how shear stress varies over the height of the cross section is just a straight line here, where our value is uh, tau, and that's given by V over A. Now this is actually called the average shear stress because it's simply averaging internal shear force over the cross-sectional area. And it turns out that for internal shear forces that are related to internal moments, and we know within beams that there is that relationship between shear force and moment um, because of what we've talked about in terms of plotting the shear and moment diagrams where one is the, the derivative of the other or in the other direction, one's the integral of the other. So you know that internal shear force and moment are related. When internal shear force is related to internal moment, the shear stress that actually exists within the beam over the cross-sectional height does not follow this profile. So I'll just show you what the, the distribution of shear stress actually looks like over this cross-section, and then we'll talk about why that's the case. Okay, so I'm going to draw what the distribution of shear stress actually looks like over this cross section. So there's tau, uh, there's h, and we'll just continue uh, our lines over here. So the shear stress at the top and the bottom of that cross section are actually equal to zero. There's, there's no shear stress at the top and the bottom. And the shear stress in the center of that beam is actually the maximum value of shear stress. And the, the profile of the curve follows a, para, a parabola, and it sort of looks like this, okay? Where we have a maximum shear stress right at the location of the centroid, and the maximum shear stress in this case is quite a bit larger than what you'd get if you calculated the average shear stress using tau equals V over A. Okay, so the question is, so this is, this is the actual profile of tau. And the question is, obviously, why? 
So there's there's be, before we get into explaining why there's there's something that you need to keep in mind while I'm going through this this explanation and, and the the explanation is going to start sort of on the conceptual level and then we're going to extend it into um, a formalized mathematical derivation of a new equation for shear stress um, transverse shear stress within within a beam and. It's it's actually the, the equation that we come up with is is maybe not the easiest equation to understand, but if you pay attention during the derivation, you actually learn a lot and you'll understand how the equation is applied a lot better. So so stick with the derivation as I go along. But first of all, um, you need to keep in mind the idea of complementary shear stresses that we touched on briefly in the lecture about torsion. Um, so I'm gonna flip to a new page now and let's just draw that rectangular uh, beam that's cut to expose its internal cross section here again. Okay, and it's experiencing an internal shear force. Let's say it's in that direction. What I want you to keep in mind in terms of uh, the idea of complementary shear stresses is this. So let's say we have uh, some point in this cross section and we want to draw that single point of material as a volumetric element. So that's that's a small bit of volume that actually makes up that point. So I'm gonna draw that here. So we've got something like this. Okay, and I'll put on the the hidden lines of this object here. Now, just to I'm just straighten out a line here since we're uh, did do the best job at keeping that line so linear. It's not really important, but just cosmetically it looks nicer. Um, okay, so in terms of orientation here, what you need to keep in mind when when you're looking at these volumetric elements is which face of the element is actually sitting in the section plane that's been drawn. So if I outline here the section plane in red, then the face of the volumetric element that is in the section plane is this right-hand face here. And the rest of that element projects into the remainder of the beam. Okay, so if there's, if there's a shear force, an internal shear force that's downward, then on the face of that element that is in the section plane, there will be a shear stress tau that is oriented downward. And if this face has an area dA, and this is in fact a perfect cube, so all of the faces have the same area dA, then if we take tau and we multiply tau by area dA, then we get a force, right? And this force is in the y direction, downward force in the y direction. Um, stress times an area gives us a force. So this being a volumetric element of material, this just like the object needs to obey the equations of statics if it's in static equilibrium. Right now, it has a downward force in the y direction with no counterbalancing upward force in the y direction. So this object is not in static equilibrium currently, and it's going to accelerate downward. So to counterbalance that, we need an equal and opposite force in the y direction. And that comes from having a shear stress that is equal in magnitude on the left-hand side, tau. However, this object is still not in static equilibrium. If you take, for example, a sum of the moments about this red dashed line that I'm drawing, then you will see that 
the force produced by the shear stress on the left hand side creates a moment about that red dotted line that is unbalanced. There's no counteracting moment. So what we need to counterbalance that is an equal magnitude shear stress facing in that direction on the top surface. So this is tau. Now we've got a situation where our moments are actually balanced about that red dotted line. But we've created a problem. Uh, now the forces in the horizontal direction aren't balanced. So we need an equal and opposite shear stress pointing toward the right on the bottom of the element. Okay, so this has to be tau. So now and only now is that volumetric element in static equilibrium. Okay, and this is this is true whenever you have shear stress. Whenever you have a volumetric element, if it's got one shear stress acting upon it, it must have three other shear stresses of equal magnitude on other sides. Okay. Now the important thing about this in terms of our derivation is that the shear stress that was in the vertical direction in the same direction as the internal shear force V, that shear stress is exactly the same magnitude as a shear stress that is oriented horizontally, and that is along the length of the beam, okay? So uh, this, this is important when we're going through our derivation. So just, just keep this in mind. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at a beam under a very simple loading situation now. And again, we'll just, for simplicity's sake, we'll just make it a beam with a rectangular cross section. Doesn't really matter, um, but just for ease of sketching. Uh, so we'll, we'll make this really simple. Um, just, you know, sort of a force in the middle and two support reactions, uh, let's say like this. Um, although, it, you know, again, it doesn't really matter if, if both those support reactions are equal or that force is in the center. Um, so what I'm going to do is just draw what the shape of the shear diagram looks like here and what the shape of the moment diagram looks like here. Okay, so just get our construction lines, bring those down like that. Okay, so we know what the shear diagram is doing. It's going up by F over 2, over, down, and back along. And again, um, the fact that it's F over 2 doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Um, and our moment diagram is going up linearly and back down linearly to 0, uh, like so. And tidy this up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so what I want to do here is consider the free body diagram if I take a thin slice of this beam, and we'll make this really thin. We'll make it uh, length DL long, okay? So I'm going to sketch what that slice looks like. So we've got one cut side like that, and then we go something like that. Okay, and then there's that differential length, uh, DL, and then we've got the other side that looks like this. Okay. So there's our dimension DL right there. So we've got centroidal axis on this side. Well, that would be nice if it was parallel to the actual uh, perspective that I've drawn. So let's try that again. And it would be nice if it was dashed like we usually do for centroidal axes. There we go. Third time's a charm. Um, and then we've got another centroidal axis for the centroid on the other side. Okay, um, so let's look at the internal forces here. So we'll just follow these uh, section cuts down 
like this. Okay, so in terms of shear, right, we see that we've got the same value of shear on both sides. It's, um, it's negative in terms of its sign, so that means shear, internal shear forces that are acting to rotate the beam or the, the section in a counterclockwise direction. So we've got one shear force V like this and another shear force uh, V like that. Now our internal moments, um, what, and I, actually I'm just gonna move um, those shear forces a little bit. I'm gonna put them uh, back here a little bit. You'll see why, I just wanna create more space here. So we've got V like that. Okay, um, <clears throat> and then for our moments, um, let's call the moment on that side M. So here's the moment on the right-hand side, that's M. And then the moment on the left-hand side is just, it's, it's a little bit bigger, right? Um, so this is going to be on this side, M plus D. And again, I'm going to move that backwards uh, a little bit out of the way here. So this is going to be M plus D M here. Okay. Um, now we know that moments create stress due to bending, normal stress due to bending. And we know now what the, the what the profile of that normal stress distribution looks like over the cross section. So if we focus in on the, the stress caused by moment M here for a second on the right hand side, then at, we know at the top of the beam, we're going to have uh, compressive stress. Let's make that stress a little bit smaller, something like that. And the magnitude of that stress, that compressive stress, is going to decrease in a linear fashion moving toward the neutral axis of bending. So if I'm drawing the distribution of normal stress right on the cross section here, at the middle where we hit the neutral axis of bending, the stress is zero, and then we get a linear increase in compressive stress moving outwards. So that's the distribution of stress due to M. And let's, let's just call that the stress on the right-hand side of the beam. Um, so sigma subscript R, just for the stress on the right-hand side of the beam. And then for tensile stress, we've got the exact same distribution just mirrored um, on the bottom here. So the tensile stress is going to be maximal right on the bottom and we've got a nice linear decrease in stress moving toward the neutral axis of bending okay so that's that's the overall distribution of normal stress due to the internal moment m on the right hand side of this section cut now let's look at the distribution of stress on the uh, left hand side and I'm just going to take this label and I'm just going to move it over there. Um, so on the left hand side of the beam our moment is slightly larger so that means that the stresses, the bending stresses are going to be slightly larger. Now I'm going to draw them in, in an exaggerated way and make them a lot larger um, just for more visual impact here. So at the top of the beam the compressive stress is going to be greater on the left-hand side than it was on the right-hand side. So here's a larger compressive stress. And that compressive stress is going to decrease linearly to zero at the neutral axis of bending. So here we go, something like that. And then we've got maximum maximal tensile stress at the bottom of the beam, and that tensile stress is going to decrease linearly to zero at the neutral axis of bending, something like that. So this is our stress distribution on the left-hand side of the beam, sigma subscript L. Now, what I am going to do uh, now is take a section cut of this section of beam. So I'm gonna resection our section 
uh, which which is a little bit uh, weird, but you'll you'll see why in a second. So, first of all, I'm just going to take this sketch here, and I'm going to move it to a new page. So copy that. Let's plop that onto a new page so we have it beside what we're working on. There we go. So that's nice. So now I can draw my section cut right next to uh, that there. So we're going to take a section cut through, um, let's say, it doesn't really matter what the position is. Let's say we're taking a section cut right through there. So the sectioned portion of our beam looks like this. Okay. Now I'm, I'm not going to bother drawing it out in three dimensions here. I'm just going to keep it in, um, in two dimensions here and we can see the three dimensional side next to it. So what, I, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to sketch out the rest of this plane um, just in dashed lines so you can see relative to where we are, where the whole thing lies, what the rest of the section piece of beam looks like. So there we are. And our neutral axis of bending is right in the center here on the right and right in the center there on the left and we had distributions that looked something like this okay there we go so <clears throat> if we were to take um the stress on the right hand side of this little bit of the section cut that i've made so here we go here's the stress on the right hand side there we go, the stress on the right hand side. If we were to take that and we were to take the stress that existed at every single point on the right hand side, multiply it by the little differential area that it acts upon and sum all of those up, then that stress multiplied by an area summed would give us a force. So in other words, what we wanna do is do the integral of the stress on the right hand side multiplied by dA and we're going to do that integration over the area which sigma r acts upon. So if I'm returning now to um, my 3D sketch and, and show you what that area is, right? This section cut that I've made is going all the way Let's draw that again, try it for a better parallel line here. So that's going all the way down there. And we're integrating over this uh, hatched area, which we'll call uh, area A prime, since it's not the full cross-sectional area, it's just a portion of the cross-sectional area. Um, so here we're performing this integral over A prime, right? And what that gives us is, uh, a force in the x direction on the right hand side and it's it's a normal force because that force would be perpendicular to to the surface so let's just call this a normal force on the right hand side and subscript r now on the left hand side the stress distribution and you might now be able to see where this is going maybe um, the stress distribution looks something like this here is sigma L, okay? And then we do the same thing right here. We'd say that taking the stress on the left-hand side and multiplying the stress at every point by the area, the differential area that it acts upon, and then summing those up over area A prime, then gives us a force, it's a normal force, and we'll call it N subscript L because it acts upon the left-hand side, okay? Now, what you can get an appreciation of now is that our force NL is greater than our force NR, so right now, 
the sum of the forces in the x direction, if we take our horizontal direction to be uh, the x direction, does not equal zero. Right, so that little segment that I've cut out, that is not in static equilibrium, right? Um, the forces are not balanced. So what we need to balance this in the x direction and keep it static is we, we need another force that's pointing toward the left. And the only available surface that we have, we've considered the, the forces in the x direction on all the surfaces. The only surface that we have is this new section surface that we've created to draw this diagram. And that's that one that I've just outlined in red there. Um, so what we need is we need a force that's pointing toward the left. And that force is parallel, well, it should be, let's try and again, let's go for a, a more parallel line. That force is parallel to that section surface, so that force is a shear force, shear force V, right? Um, and if we're thinking about um, shear stress here now, we could, we could take that um, shear force and divide it by the area that it's acting over and get a shear stress, right? So we say that tau is equal to V divided by the area that, that acts over. And we know what the length dimension that it acts over is because we know that this length here is dl, so we got dl down there, and then we the the dimension in the other direction, right? We'll call this direction here um, the thickness of the beam. Let's say t, right? So we've got dl multiplied by t there. Okay. So if we wanted, if we wanted um, something that was sort of in the form of what we have up there, where we've got a force equals a stress times an area, then we could just rewrite this as uh, our shear force equals shear stress T tau multiplied by T dl, okay? So um, getting back to the sketch that we've just done, let's, um, let's now clip out this little piece here. Okay. And let's, let's actually, let's take this whole thing with us. I'm just thinking ahead to what we're gonna uh, want on the board in quotation marks when we continue with this derivation um, after we finish the conceptual part of it. Okay, so there we go. Okay, and we'll get rid of this there and we'll just take this and move it vertically down there somewhere. Okay. Um, and then let's uh, let's grab this. Maybe we'll do some more erasing here and grab this and chuck it over there and then grab this here and chuck it up there. Okay. Hope you don't guys don't mind me doing that in terms of taking notes if you're if you're taking notes, which I hope you are. Um okay. Um so the thing to realize now right, is, is the magnitude of V here, the magnitude of V, tau is, tau is proportional to the magnitude of V. And the magnitude of V depends on where that secondary section cut that we took was. If you take the stress distribution on the right-hand side and you were to flip it over and mirror it onto the left-hand side, right, you'd get a distribution that looked like that. So this area here, that shaded area is, 
that's proportional, or that is V, that shaded area. And that's proportional to tau. And what you can see now is that when we move this section cut up or down, that shaded area that I've sketched changes, which means that the internal shear force changes, which means that the shear stress changes. And remember, the shear stress in the horizontal direction parallel to the length of the beam is equal in magnitude at any point in, within the cross section to the shear force acting transversely over the cross section, right, in the direction perpendicular to length. So if we take a section cut uh, very close to the top of the beam uh, up here, right, then what have we got? We've got a tiny little section like this, and we've got a rest of our beam going down like this. And here are our centroids. And we've got distributions that look like this, right? Now the stress distribution is like that, and the stress distribution is like that. And the area difference between those is now very small, right? So here's V now. So it's much smaller than the V previously. So now you can start to see, if I just draw our cross section of our beam up here. There you go, there's the centroid, centroidal axis. Here's our shear force V. And we said that the distribution of shear stress over the cross section was zero at the top and bottom and reached a maximum at the location of the centroid. Right, like that. So again, this is tau and this is height in the cross section. H, and there's the distribution of shear stress, right? So as we move this section cut up and up and up, this area becomes smaller, and because that area eventually uh, goes to zero, so does the shear stress, and that's why shear stress is zero at the top of the cross section, right? Now, when we drew this original case here, we were somewhere between the top and the centroid, so we're somewhere uh, here on that little distribution. If we were to bring that section cut down toward where the neutral axis of bending is, we can see why we have maximal shear stress at that location, because when we do that, that hatched area, the red hatched area that represents the internal shear force becomes maximal. So here we go. Right. So if we drop down that section cut right here, bring it right to the location of the centroid, got a distribution of normal stress on one side, distribution of normal stress on the other side and flipping that stress on the right hand side over to the left and then drawing the area right we can see that this gives us the maximal internal shear right which is right there draw that in blue because it's a shear force right there's v max Okay, and here, when I'm talking about V max now, I'm talking about um, the maximum internal shear force at a particular height location in, in the cross section. Okay, uh, so this is going to give us tau max, which exists at the center of tau max. There we go. So conceptually, this is why shear stress follows that parabolic distribution, uh, changing with height position within the cross section. 
Okay, so we can um, we can carry on from uh, the drawing that we had right here to actually come up with um, a formalized definition of what the shear stress is at any uh, height position within the cross section. So we'll just flip to a new page and I think that's still on my clipboard so we can paste that there. Okay, great. Um, so let's, for this, for this little section cut that we've done, what we want to do now is we want to do a formal sum of the forces in the x direction equation. So sum of the forces in the x direction has to be equal to zero for uh, this little piece of material here, which remember extends backward uh, that way, but I'm not drawing the rest of it in 3D just to keep things a little bit cleaner. Um, okay, so let's let's look at what we have. So we've got two different forces that are pointing toward the left, right? We've got um, one right here and one right here. So we've got the normal force acting towards the right plus that internal shear force has to be equal to the normal force acting on the left hand side of the beam. Okay. Now we know that uh, nr can be substituted by that integral that we have there, so let's pop that in. So we've got the integral over area a prime of sigma r d a plus. Uh, we know what v is in relation to shear stress here. v is tau t dl, so we can pop that in tau t dl because remember we're looking for a relationship between tau and internal shear force v and that's going to be equal to the integral over a prime of the stress on the left hand side uh, with a differential area um, okay now at this point we we know that we can substitute in for sigma in terms of our stress uh, due to bending sigma equals my over i so let's make that substitution there so we've got here the integral over a prime the stress on the right hand side um, the stress on the right hand side is just coming from our moment m so we've got my over i and then da plus tau t dl equals the integral over a prime. Now the stress on the left hand side, remember, is a little bit bigger because the moment on that side was a little bit bigger. It was m plus dm. So we've got m plus dm for the moment there, uh, y over i dA. Now we have an my over i on the left hand side and an my over i on the right hand side as well. So those are going to cancel off. So we're going to get that term canceling off with that m. Okay, now let's, um, we're, we're trying to get an equation for shear stress tau. So it makes sense to isolate that and divide through by. Uh, TDL, so let's do that. So we've got tau is the integral, and that should be over a prime there, of dm, and then we're going to put the dl under that, and then we've got 1 over, and we'll put the i and the t under there, and then we've got yda. So we're going to do it like that. So that covers all of our terms. Let's check. We've got our dm, we've got our y, we've got our i, we've got our t, and we've got our dl. Okay, so we've got all our terms there. Um, so let's let's grab that and take it over to the next page and uh, continue working with that copy. Probably just as easy to rewrite it, but um, there we go. Okay, um, so thinking about this over area A prime. Now remember what area A prime actually is here. Um, let's flip back 
here. So area A prime is this area right there. So maybe maybe we want to um, uh, take actually this and put it beside where we're doing the derivation. So we can just remember what the variable A prime represents and what the variable T represents for thickness of the beam. Maybe that would be helpful. So let's do that. Okay, there we go. So now we can see what those things uh, represent that we're talking about. Um, okay, so what we want to do now is think about which of these terms are constants uh, and can be moved outside of this integral sign. So first of all, um, I. I's moment of inertia of the cross section. It's not changing um, with respect to position within the cross section. Um, T, right? T in this case is not changing with position in the cross section. Um, so that's that's a constant as well. So those can come out. Um, DM, DL, DM, DL, DM, so DM, DL. DM, DL, that sounds familiar. That is the slope of a moment diagram. And we know what that's equal to. Slope of the moment diagram is given by the value of shear, right? So DM, DL is V. So we can make that substitution, and then our internal shear, our internal shear doesn't vary with um, position in the cross section, so that's a constant. So we can move all of those things outside of that integral sign. So you've got V over IT, and then the integral over A prime. Now we've only got YDA left here. So let's, let's think about what that integral y dA actually is. So let's uh, let's just draw what we have here. So we've got this little sectioned piece. Then we've got the remainder of the slice of our beam down here. And we've got something that looks like this. Right, where here is our area A prime. Now, the, the, the variable y in this equation, that comes from our equation for bending my over i. And if we take some uh, small differential area, within a prime here. So let's just uh, choose um, some little area here. All right, so this is our little area dA. What our variable y is, remember, is how far that area is away from the neutral axis of bending measured perpendicularly. So in this integral here, wanted my pen there, not my eraser. Um, in this integral here, what we're doing is we're taking that distance y, multiplying it by area dA, and summing those up over the entire uh, cross-sectional area. So what that is equivalent to doing is just taking the overall centroid location of A prime, measuring the distance between the centroid of A prime and the neutral axis, and we'll call that Y bar prime since it's the centroid location of A prime, and multiplying those together. So I'm just gonna put on my uh, little area DA again here. Here's DA. And there is distance y. So we can say that the integral, let's put that down a bit, the integral over a prime of y dA is actually equal to 
the product y bar prime, which is the centroid location of a prime relative to that same axis that distance y is being measured from, multiplied by area a prime. Okay, and that's um, again that's that's exactly the same as what we're doing when we find centroids using that equation that comes out of the um, first moment of area, right? Uh, when we go y bar equals sum of a y bar over sum of a, right? This this relationship up here exactly follows that. So if we redefine uh, this as a variable q, then we have an equation now for shear stress, tau equals vq, and q is taking the place of this integral here, right? So this is becoming q. Uh, vq over it. Okay, so there we have it. There's our equation for shear stress at any height position in a cross section due to an internal shear force. So let's, let's just uh, return to this cross section of the rectangular beam and talk about each of those components in that equation and what they mean. Okay, so let's just go back here and we'll just draw our cross section again. And we'll just think about calculating shear stress at some example location so that we know what all those different components of the equation actually mean. So if we've got a shear force that's oriented like that, that means bending's happening a happening about the horizontal centroidal axis like that. So let's say, just for example, that we want to calculate the shear stress here at location uh, one. Okay, well, let's just, let's call that location A. Doesn't really matter. Um, so the question is tau at A is our question mark, okay? Our equation here for shear stress is VQ over IT, where Q is A prime Y bar prime. I, I like to write A prime, actually, when I write out what Q is, because you should always figure out what a prime is first and then worry about y bar prime. It doesn't make sense picking y bar prime until you until you've decided what a prime is. Okay, so let's let's talk about all the different terms in this um, this equation for internal shear stress due to a shear force. So I actually let's start with V, right? V. V, v is simply our internal shear force at our longitudinal location of interest. So we know that uh, internal shear force is going to vary depending on where we are along the length of a beam. Um, the internal shear force is, uh, is the same over the cross section here. Um, the, the the resulting uh, internal shear force is the same over the, the cross section. So this this is simply the internal shear force force at your location of interest. Shear force at longitudinal location of interest, right? So we've got two locations of interest now. We've got our location along the length of the beam and the location within the cross section. So here I'm specifying that this is the internal shear force at the longitudinal location of interest. Uh, we'll deal with Q uh, in a minute. I, I is always the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis that is perpendicular to V, 
Okay, so moment of inertia about axis that's perpendicular to V. And this should be about centroidal axis that's perpendicular to uh, V. Okay, uh, T, 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 T in the denominator there. What is T? So when you're calculating a shear stress using this equation, tau equals VQ over IT, right? Shear stress varies with height position in the cross section. Um, in the other dimension, which is sort of like into the plane of the, the screen here, um, the shear stress is the same at all points. So when we're calculating tau using this equation and looking for tau at A, all of the points along this blue line that I'm drawing have equal shear stresses. So if you draw a line through the location of interest in your cross section and perpendicular to your shear force, that's parallel to your centroidal axis of bending, all the points along that line have equal shear stress. And the length of that line that you draw, that is your variable t. Okay, so this dimension here is t. So what I like to say is t is the length of the line along which you are calculating the shear stress, because you're calculating the shear stress at all points along that line. All points share the same shear stress. So t is the length of that line. So it's the length of line you are calculating leading shear stress along. Okay, great. Um, now let's deal with uh, Q now, right? Q has two components, Q. Q equals A prime Y bar prime. So A prime. A prime. A prime is always the area. So you have you have choices here um, in what you take as Q. Q or what you take as A prime. A prime is the area on one side or the other side of the line that you're calculating the shear stress along, right? So we're calculating shear stress along that blue line. Area A prime can be uh, this area, A prime, right? The portion of the cross section that lies below that line, or you could take it as the portion of the cross section that lies above that line, right? So if we just um, clip this out here, right, and copy that and flip to a new page and pop that in there. Instead of taking A prime as that area there, it would be equally correct to take A prime as the area above that line. So you could take your area A prime as this area here. Right, so that could be your A prime too. It just has to be the area of the cross section on one side or the other side of the line that you're calculating the shear stress tau along. Okay. So uh, let's um, let's write that down there. Okay. So let's move a couple of things around here so we can uh, have some room to uh, put that in. Let's take this and move it down there and we'll grab this and move it down there as well. Okay, let me just shift all of this stuff up here. Okay, 
So a prime is the portion of the cross section on one side of line that tau is being calculated along. Okay, and then y bar prime, right? Y bar prime is the distance from the centroid of A prime to the neutral axis of bending, the perpendicular distance between the centroid of A prime and the neutral axis of bending or the centroidal axis that's perpendicular to V. So this is Y bar prime here. Now, if we're flipping over and looking at the alternative choice of A prime that we had, which is equally correct, right? The centroid of A prime in this case lies a little bit above the centroid of the whole cross section because we don't have some of the material at the bottom right here. So the centroid of A prime is gonna be above the centroid of the whole cross section. So distance Y bar prime is this distance uh, here. So there's y bar prime distance from the centroid of A prime to the centroid of the overall cross section. Now you can see in this option, A prime is quite a bit bigger than the other option, but y bar prime is quite a bit smaller. And here, A prime is quite a bit smaller, but y bar prime is quite a bit bigger. For either of those options, when you take the product A prime y bar prime, for the value Q. The value Q in this case is exactly the same as the value of Q in this case. So that's why it doesn't matter which of these two you uh, choose because Q is A prime Y bar prime, taking the product to get Q, you get the same Q when you take the product in this case. So uh, just to put that into words down here, Y bar prime is the distance between the centroid of A prime and the centroid of uh, the cross section. So perpendicular distance between centroid of A prime and centroid of whole cross section. Okay. So now you've got now you've got a well now you've got I was going to say a good uh, definition of what all the variables are but of course that's uh, for you to decide so now now you've got a definition of sort of what all of the variables are in that equation and hopefully you're clear on what all they mean what they all mean and how to apply them so um, let's let's uh, hit this home with a couple of examples okay um, so example okay so we'll we'll do a really um, simple one here um, just to just to illustrate it and then we'll then we'll do a, a second example too okay um, so here we've got a beam okay and uh, we've got the cross section of the beam here, it's just gonna be uh, rectangular again. We're keeping it simple, okay. Uh, dimensions are six inches height. And for a width, we've got three inches. And loading situation is going to be uh, something like this. So we've got um, a load of six KIP here and uh, three KIP here, and then we've got a um, pin over there and a roller over there, and dimensions here, length dimensions are, let's, um, let's make them all easy. So we've got one foot there, 
one foot there, obviously not perfectly to scale by any means, and one foot there. So one, one, and one. So what we want to know is um, what is the largest average shear stress in the beam. So if we were going to, so the idea behind that is if, if we were using the old um, equation for internal shear stress tau equals v over a what would you what would you calculate as the maximum shear stress if you were using that so uh maximum i'll say maximum average shear stress and what is actually the true uh maximum shear stress due to our internal shear force okay so here do to our internal shear force, uh, shear forces V. Okay, um, so uh, in order to calculate either of these, we want to know first what our maximum internal shear force is with length, which means we want our shear diagram um, which means that we want support reactions first. So I'm just going to draw the uh, axes for my shear diagram. So I reserve that space here. Okay. And then we'll do the support reactions. So um, let's assume that this is upward and this is also upward, A, Y, and B, Y. Um, so we can do some of the moments about A is equal zero, and that gives us what BY is going to be. So we've got what? Six multiplied by one plus B multiplied, BY multiplied by two. Um, that should be a minus there. Do, 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 do. Minus uh, plus. We've got a um a three multiplied by three plus three by three equals zero okay so that's going to give us by is equal to what do we have 7.5 kip okay there now i didn't give uh, a definition of which direction was positive or negative but Going by my signs, I was taking the clockwise to be positive there. Um, okay, and so now we can do some of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero here. So what we've got AY and BY have to balance out the downward load. So we've got AY plus 7.5 is equal to six plus three. AY is equal to 1.5 KIP. Okay, so now we can draw our shear diagram. So shear diagram starts at zero, then it jumps up by the magnitude of Ay, which is 1.5. Uh, no distributed loads, so it continues horizontally with zero slope, and then jumps down by six. Okay, so that brings us to minus 4.5. No distributed load, zero slope. Uh, BY, we jump up by what, seven and a half from minus four and a half. So that gives us a difference of plus three there. Uh, continue along horizontally because there's no distributed load and then jump down by three, which brings us back to zero, which is what we want. Right, so we can see here that our maximum internal shear force is minus 4.5 uh, kip, right? All right, or the magnitude, if we just want the absolute, uh, is four and a half uh, kip. Okay, so now that we've got that, we can uh, do our calculation, right? So um let's look at the max uh average shear stress right so if before this lecture if i just had to ask you what's the maximum shear stress within the beam you would have done this um looking at 
Vmax simply divided by area A. So we've got 4.5 times 10 to the 3 divided by, what do we have there for a cross section? 6 inches by 3 inches. 6 by 3, which is going to give us 250 PSI. Okay. And now let's look what, at what the actual maximum shear stress is in this beam. So that's going to be given by VQ over IT. Now, whenever you're using this equation here, um, what, what you want to do is do a little sketch of a cross section and shade or hatch in what you're choosing as your area A prime because um, the numbers in the equation can mean very little to somebody who you're trying to show what you know that you know what you're doing if if uh, you don't relay or relay properly relay the information about what area you've chosen as area A prime. Okay, so if we're looking for maximum shear stress, um, here's our uh, here's our section, right? So if, if the rest of the beam is going back this way, then we know here that V max, the shear force is 4.5 KIP. I've drawn it um, upward because that's, um, that's the definition of a negative internal shear force is acting to rotate that section in the counterclockwise direction. Um, and we know what the distribution of shear stress is over this cross section, right? If we're graphing tau uh, down here over height or by height of the cross section here, then at the top and the bottom, shear stress tau is zero, and then the shear stress reaches a maximum at the location of the centroid, right? So there is our maximum shear stress right in the middle of the beam, right? So tau max exists along that line. So I'm I want to calculate the shear stress along that blue line that I've drawn along the cross section, which means my area A prime is the area on one side or the other side of that line. Right, so I'm going to take this as my area A prime, and then here's the centroid of A prime. Y bar prime is the distance between that centroid and the centroidal axis for the whole beam. So that's Y bar prime. Okay. So uh, thinking about our dimensions now, right, this is three inches here. This is six inches here, which means that this is three inches there, which means that Y bar prime is one and a half inches. So let's fill in our numbers here. So we've got V uh, 4.5 times 10 to the three to put that in units of pounds. Uh, Q, remember, is A prime Y bar prime. So for the A prime part of it, we're taking three by three. So three by three, and this is our area A prime. And then for Y bar prime, that is half of three, so 1.5, right? So this is Y bar prime there. Then we're dividing by I. Now we want to calculate I about the centroidal axis that's perpendicular to V. So that's the horizontal centroidal axis. So we've got 1 12th base where our base is the dimension parallel to that axis, which is 3 uh, height cubed. And then T, again, the length of the line along which you're calculating the shear stress. So that's 3 inches. Okay, so um, crunch your numbers and you get 375 PSI. Okay. So um, comparing these, right? Uh, the actual shear stress, the max, the actual maximum shear stress in this beam is significantly higher than what you would calculate as the maximum if you were using the equation for average.
shear stress. All right, um, let's look at, uh, before we do another example, let's look at how the shear stress varies over a couple of other cross-sectional profiles. Okay, so um, let's look at an I-beam, for example. Okay, there we go. It's not the most beautiful I-beam in the world, but it'll do. Okay, and let's just draw our let's draw a rectangle for reference and we'll just shift this shift this down a bit. There we go. Okay, so let's draw a rectangular beam for reference here. So we've got a shear force there and we're drawing the distribution of shear stress along it and again whenever we drew these uh, sketches of distributions of shear stress acting over the cross section sometimes you don't even set up your uh, axes completely uh, properly here um, you're graphing shear stress tau versus height location in the cross section H. Often I'll just draw a straight vertical line for my uh, location H and not even draw that uh, horizontal x-axis for um, tau. So here's the centroid location, right? So we've already done this one. You've got a distribution that looks like Again, a parabolic distribution uh, that reaches a maximum at the location of the centroid. Okay, so for an I-beam, um, and here I'll do just what I normally do, um, we've got, put out some lines like this to help us. So the centroid of the I-beam is right in the middle there. Right, so if you if you're graphing or sketching what the distribution of shear stress over this cross section looks like, you know, think of it as being made of rectangles. You already know what the distribution looks like for a rectangle, so just think of the I beam as being made of rectangles. Right, if you if you're up at the top or up at the bottom of the cross section, shear stress is zero, um, for the same reason that the that the area A prime in your equation would go to zero as you go to the top or the bottom, or alternatively, your distance y bar prime would go to zero. Um, Q goes to zero in any case. So then if we think about um, moving from the top of the cross section, right downwards. So we think about going from here to going to a location like that, then we're just moving through a rectangle. So the graph's gonna sort of be a curve with a decreasing slope like this. And, and on the bottom moving upwards, we're gonna get a mirror image, right? So we've got something that looks like this. Now, thinking about the equation, tau equals VQ over I, let's try that again, IT. When we reach this point here, where we go from the flange of the I-beam to the web portion of the I-beam, the thickness goes down dramatically. So we go from something that has a large thickness, T, to something that has a very small thickness, T. So that's going to cause a spike up in the shear stress. So we're going to get our shear stress that jumps up like this. Okay, and the same on this side, something like that. And then again, moving downwards, so now we're here and we're going farther uh, downwards. Again, we're just in another rectangle now, so um, the shape of the curve is going to follow exactly what it would look like if, if we were using um, the rectangle above, right? We're just going to have um, a decrease in the slope of the curve, reaching a maximum at the location of the centroid, right, where our maximum shear stress T tau max is right there. 
Okay. Great. Um, let's think about a T-shaped cross section of T-beam. Okay, just like an I-beam with the uh, bottom piece missing or the bottom flange missing. So uh, shear stress distribution over something that's shaped like this. So centroid is closer to the top than it is to the bottom. Mark that out and mark out the bottom there. Okay, shear stress at the top and the bottom of the cross section will be zero from the top downwards. Uh, we're going through a rectangle, so we have a curve like this. Then the thickness goes down dramatically, so we have a spike up. Then moving again through a rectangle, so the curve is just decreasing in slope until we reach a maximum at the location of the centroid. Here's tau max. And then curving down to zero on the other side because we're just moving through the other side of the rectangle. Right, so there's the distribution of shear stress over a beam that has a T-shaped cross section. Um, for something that has a channel uh, shape. So channel shape is something like this, right? One way up or the other. That's no different than, um, than a T-beam, right? We get, we get the exact same shape distribution of shear stress. We start at zero at the top, zero at the bottom, and then we're moving through a rectangle, then we jump up, right? Now, importantly here, when we get into this next section and we're wanting to calculate the shear stress, let's say at this location, so our shear force is oriented uh, like that. If we want to calculate the shear stress here, the thickness T in the equation is remember the length of the line over which you're calculating the shear stress. So the thickness is not the length of that entire line from one side to another because that line's going through air for most of it um, and there's no shear stress there, right? You just You just have stress within the material. So here the total thickness is let's say those two lengths combined. So half T and half T. So we use T is equal to half T, half T, T, right? When we use that, that equation, okay? Um, so our, again, if you consider those as, as one combined, um, a rectangle of thickness T, then it becomes just like a, a T beam, right? And you're moving through another rectangle here. So uh, the centroid of the channel section is closer to the top than the bottom. And this curve will just increase like this, moving to the centroid where it will reach maximum and then it will decrease like that. So exactly the same uh, shaped profile. So that's uh, tau max there. Okay, that's a little bit. That's a little bit ugly. So let's just uh, let's just clip that and shift it back here so we can draw that properly. Okay, there we go. So tau max. Okay. Um, so those are some shapes. Now, if you if you notice, um, for all of these that are common shapes to use. Um, they all have maximal shear stresses that occur at the location of the centroid. That's that's not strictly always true. You know, you can think up a beam shape that would not have a maximum shear stress at the location of the centroid. For example, if you had um, a beam that was uh, shaped with a cruciform uh, type cross-sectional profile for some weird reason. Um, do this here like that, and you've got an internal shear force V that's acting over that cross section. And let's just plot what the distribution of shear stress would look like. So you've got ch -ch 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 -ch, something like this. Uh, centroid is right in the middle of that shape. Mark that out. 
Okay, so starting from the top, zero shear stress, zero shear stress at the bottom, and then you're moving through a rectangle, right? So the shear stress is increasing steadily. Now you get to a situation where your thickness goes from being a small value to um, a large value. So you get a dramatic drop in shear stress, and then your curve would go and reach a local maximum before coming back down and then do the uh, matching thing here. So in this case, right, your maximum shear stresses, there's two of them, and they're on uh, each side right at the interface um, between those those two bits there. Right, so most most of the time, for, for most of the cross sections, we see maximum shear stresses at the location of the centroid, but that's not strictly uh, strictly the case for all cross sections. Okay, so let's do uh, one more example problem uh, just to uh, give you, you know, a, a little better feel about how the equation for transverse shear stress works. So in this equation, example, we're going to have a beam that has a cross section uh, that is a T. Uh, it's actually made of two pieces of wood that are going to be glued together. Okay, so this joint here is a glued joint. Okay, let's put some dimensions on here. So this, and I'll move cross section label up slightly here. Um, so this dimension here is going to be 150 millimeters, and then we've got what, 30 millimeters here, and then same deal, 150 millimeters and 30 millimeters. So we've taken, that should be a three, there we go. Um, so we've taken two boards of equal dimensions and glued them together in a T configuration to, to make a T beam. Um, let's draw the uh, loading scenario and the length dimensions of the beam. So we've got um, loads of a distributed load acting on half of the beam here. Okay, and this is 6.5 kilonewtons per meter. And we'll make this four meters and this another four meters. And let's just throw in our support reactions. We've got BY and AY here. Okay. Um, so what we want to know in this case is what is um, the required shear strength of the glue. So remember at the at the location of that glue joint, right? We're going to have shear stress that is if I just draw that um, in sort of three dimensions uh, here. So maybe it's going out like this. Right? So we've got an internal will be an internal shear force acting, that's supposed to be an internal shear force acting over the cross section, right? That's gonna cause, at the glue joint, that's gonna cause a shear stress that acts downward at that location. But remember, we also have a shear stress that's equal magnitude and acts along the length of the beam. Now that shear stress that's acting along the length of the beam at the location of the junction is acting to break the glue, okay? So if we're, if we're wondering what is the required shear strength of the glue, then we want what is the shear stress present, the maximum shear stress present at the location of that glued junction. So um, our question is, um, what is the required shear strength of the 
glue that we're using. Okay. All right. So we're going to want to use um, tau equals vq divided by it. And I've kind of already explained uh, where we want the shear stress, right? We want the shear stress right at that location of the junction there because that's where the shear stress is that's breaking, acting to break the glue. So our area A prime, we want to be uh, one side or the other side of that location where we want the shear stress. So this could be our area A prime there. So we've talked about what uh, Q is. Um, v in this equation, we want this to be the maximum internal shear force within the beam because we want to know what the maximum shear stress at that glued junction is. Um, so we need V max to complete this equation. So let's get it from our shear diagram. So our shear diagram, uh, which is going to be in units of kilonewtons here. So let's lay that out. Um, and before we do the shear diagram, we need what the support reactions are. So we can do some of the moments about A is equal to zero. And unlike the last problem, I'm going to set up my convention uh, now and take counterclockwise as being positive. So we've got BY multiplied by eight minus 6.5 multiplied by four for the resultant. And then the distance of the resultant away from AY is going to be four plus two is six and that has to be equal to zero so that gives me by is 19.5 kilonewtons okay and then do the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero and we've got ay plus by 19 let's try that again 19.5 uh, has to be the total downward load 6.5 multiplied by 4. So this gives us Ay is equal to 6.5 uh, kilonewtons. So now we can draw our shear diagram. Starts at zero. Let's get their construction lines here to help us out. Okay, ends at zero. And we're jumping up in magnitude by Ay. So we've got 6.5 there. Uh, no distributed load, zero distributed load, zero slope. So we continue on. Then we've got constant uh, negative values of distributed load. So we've got a constant negative slope. Where do we get to? Well, we don't have to make any calculation at all because we know we have to jump back up to zero. So this has to be uh, the negative of by, which we said was 19.5. So here we've got negative 19.5. So that is uh, v max, right? So now we've got v max is 19.5 kilonewtons. All right, so let's um, let's go over to the next page here and I'm just going to re-sketch the cross section that we're dealing with. Okay, so there's our T-shaped cross section. We want the shear stress along that blue line. We're taking our area A prime to be this top area. We know the centroid of the whole cross section is uh, closer to the top than the bottom and the centroid of a prime is right there so distance y bar prime is this distance there now to figure out what y bar prime is we need what y bar is we need to find the actual location of the centroid right um, and of course, we need to figure out what y bar is to figure out what i is because we need to use the parallel axis theorem in this case. So let's do the calculation for y bar first. So y bar is given by the sum of a y bar over the sum of a where we're talking about breaking uh, cross-sectional area a up into two rectangles. Um, and they were each 150 millimeters by 30 
uh, millimeters. So let's do that. So for the top piece first in the rectangle, its area is 150 by 30, and then Y bar prime for that piece, which is its centroid location relative to, sorry, um, Y bar one, uh, which is its centroid location relative to our datum is going to be our 150 millimeters and then plus half of 30. So we've got 165 there, 165. Okay, and maybe it's helpful if I just throw on what the dimensions here were. So 150 millimeters and then we had 30 millimeters there, okay. So that's where the 165 came from, 150 and half of 30. Uh, then we've got plus, and for the upright piece now, its area is 150 by 30 as well, and its centroid location relative to the datum is y bar 2, and that's going to be half of 150, so 75, 75. And then we're dividing by 2 times 150 by 30. So you can see here if we've got two pieces that have the same area, what we're really just doing is just averaging um, each of their two, the two centroids. Um, so that's going to give us 120 millimeters. Okay, now let's calculate what i is for uh, this shape. So we've got i is the sum of i plus a d squared parallel axis theorem. Uh, so our first term here, let's do the top piece, 1 12th. Its base is the 150 millimeter dimension. So we've got 0.15 switching to meters. Its height, 30 cubed plus add back on its area. There we go, and our distance d squared. Remember what d is. The d is the distance between the centroid of the shape you're dealing with and the overall centroid of the whole cross section. So there's d for one. Um, note that that is actually y bar prime uh, two. So we wanna go all the way up to the uh, the top from the bottom. So that's the uh, distance that we used for y bar one, so the 165, so 0.165, and we subtract off the distance for the, the distance between the datum and the centroid location, so that's our 120. Um, so we're taking 0.12 and subtracting that, and then don't forget to square it. Add on, same thing for our upright piece, so 1 12th base, 30, Height 150, 0.15, cube that, plus add back on the area, 0.15, 0.03. Distance uh, D, so in this case we're taking the location of the centroid and subtracting the centroid location for the upright piece, which was 75, 0.075, and square that. Okay, so that, uh, plug and chug those numbers, and we've got 2.7 times 10 to the minus five meters to the fourth power. So now we're in a position where we can uh, evaluate what our shear stress is. So once again, we'll just re-sketch uh, this cross section very quickly, and we say we want the shear stress here, so this is, our area A prime, we know the centroid for the whole uh, cross section, Y bar is 120 millimeters from the base. Okay, so we've got tau equals VQ divided by IT. Let's fill in some numbers. So for V, again, we want the maximum internal shear force, which was 19.5. Uh, kilonewtons, so we've got 19.5 times 10 to the 3. Q is A prime, Y bar prime. So our A prime, first of all, this is area A prime up here, so that's 150 millimeters multiplied by 30. So I'll just add an annotation for you, A prime. 
and then our distance y bar prime. So we get the centroid location of a prime, and we're talking about the distance between that centroid and the overall centroid location. So that was 165 minus 120 mils. Y bar prime, there we go. All divided by I, we've calculated I, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 5, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 5, multiplied by thickness T. Now here, remember, thickness T, the length of the line that you're calculating shear stress along. Uh, this bottom portion here, there's no shear stress there because that's just touching uh, air. So you do not want to take that full length as thickness T in this equation because a lot of that line does not have shear stress acting along it, right? You only want uh, that thickness there where the flange and the upright piece of the T or the horizontal and vertical pieces of the T meet one another. So that's 30 millimeters, so 0.03. Okay, and uh, what do we get coming out of that? We get a stress of 4.88 megapascals. Okay, so uh, when you go to your industrial adhesive shop, right, you want a uh, glue that has a shear strength of at least 4.88 megapascals in order to safely stick these um, together in terms of resisting shear stress at that junction. Okay, so I hope that gives you um, a good introduction to how to calculate uh, transverse shear stress and also um, a good working knowledge of how to apply the, the equation for that. So in the next uh, lecture, what we're going to look at is sort of something related to this problem that we were just looking at is like instead of, you know, glue at this junction, what about if you had a row of screws or nails that were joining those two boards together? Now, uh, the shear stress that exists at that junction would then be trying to shear those fasteners in half. So how do you decide um, how strong those fasteners need to be or uh, how closely spaced together that they need to be or given, you know, um, fastener strength and uh, longitudinal spacing, what's the maximum load that can be uh, withstood by the beam before you get shear failure of those fasteners. So um, it's going to be a short lecture and it's just, just about um, how to analyze fasteners. So I will see you for that in lecture 12.